I say tell everyone everything. Why cover anything up? Right? One, two, three, four! How to describe Frank? When I read it first, it was one of those things, you're just laughing and laughing and laughing. And then you finish reading it and you say, I know this is hilarious, but I've no idea how to translate it from page to screen. Like, I don't know how to go about the character. I don't know how to go about telling the story because it's all really funny on paper, but I just can't see how you do it. And then I met Lenny and we talked about that very thing. And we just both, I just got really excited talking to him about it. And the possibilities started opening up and flaring up. And you just think, man, this is going to be a huge challenge. But if we can do it, it'll just be mad. I find this inspiring. This sort of iconic character in Frank, who's so, um, he, there is something of that. Like in the way that you look at Chaplin and you, it is just, it's an image. For that image of Frank at the center of, of, of the story, mixed with that tonal kind of territory, just made me feel like, uh, and it, really against many voices in my head which were going, you're making a desperate mistake. This is, you know, a funny way to hand in your notice as a filmmaker, you know. The, I, I said to somebody recently that there are so many ways in which Frank could be bad as a film. And there are only a few ways that you can kind of make it really work. But that thing was the thing that grabbed me and held me. Frank, people should know about you. You should be famous. Flattered grin, followed by a bashful half smile. Stop saying your facial expressions out loud. It's extremely annoying. I wrote about 30 or 40 pages over a couple of months, uh, which was like really true to life about me joining Frank's band. And I sent it to Peter Strawn. And actually, he was the first person, he was the very first person to, to say, let's f fictionalize this slightly. So like all, like all the winds started moving towards it being fictional to some degree. And then if you're gonna have like a sort of half biopic, you know, why don't you just go the whole way and just take the spirit of Frank, but completely fictionalize it, and then you're free to do what you want. And what we did with that was brought in these other great outsider artists, Daniel Johnston and Captain Beefheart and, you know, and then sort of created this kind of parallel universe, Frank, that drew from all of those different people. For me, it was finding a character. Like, the film goes from really, like, outrageous comedy at some points, like, like physical kind of dumb and dumber slash Will Ferrell ridiculousness for some of it in terms of the physical humour and outlandishness to kind of Coen brother uh, strange territory to pathos to big musical numbers. So the challenge for me was finding a character who can do all of those in the same movie and still feel like the same man and kind of go like that. So that was the for me the challenge and that's what really got me excited about it. The mask I always just assumed would work, and um, I think it does, you know, because you've got Michael behind it. He never takes it off. You think it's weird? Would it help if I said my facial expressions out loud? Welcoming smile. Delighted look. It didn't seem like that crazy a thing to me either, you know, because um, people are strange, you know, strange and individual and unique in so many different ways with what sort of body tattoos people put on or various masks. So wearing a mask didn't seem that unrealistic as, as somebody that would be living their life like that. It's, you know, it's... There's also extensions that can be told through wearing a mask. People say, oh, you're worried about your face not being able to express what's going on, but the, sort of the mask can kind of be, become an extension anyway. Normal faces are weird too. The way they're smooth, 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 and then... Michael's so active, you know, he's so buzzy, um, that when he went still, or his head would cock slightly, you know, this thing would just kind of go like that, and uh, you, you just get terrified. You're like, I don't know if he's got, if Michael's doing his million tooth grin underneath there, or if he's, or if he's closed his eyes, or if, you know, if he's laughing at me, or if he's just bored by what I'm doing. Like, you, you don't know, and... Um, and it just kept it alive in a totally different way than when he was really, you know, buzzing off you. A lot of things can be told with the, just a, a great stillness, you know. Sometimes I thought that it would be more physical and then try different things. Sometimes checking the monitor, conferring with Lenny, um, and, you know, that's it. Just sort of, you know, feeling your way through it. The head. Take it off. 
I have a certificate. There's a sort of freeing element to wearing the, the mask as well, getting over the initial feeling of claustrophobia. Um, then it just becomes kind of fun, really, uh, other than, again, sort of figuring out where my blind spots were, and there was quite a few of them. Frank, come back! <laughs> uh, then it's just sort of, yeah, you just sort of give yourself over to the head. <laughs> my instinct was to make it all quite upbeat and all quite funny, but Peter and Lenny are both quite a lot more melancholic than I am. And so they were like, bringing sort of melancholia into it. And um, and then it was sort of weird, you know, I suddenly realised we're, we're very different personalities, the three of us, you know, and yet we're all working together towards this thing. And so it became almost like, it began to sort of feel like the three of us were like in a bag being kind of shaken up. But it really came from the kind of shared experience of, of all of us with very different personalities and very different views of the film sort of coming together and creating this kind of discordant thing, which might have been a disaster, um, but, you know, luckily, turned out to be really good. Someone needs to punch you in the face. It's a big mistake as a director not to allow the actors that you cast to influence the characters. I mean, if you're too rigid about it and you think, no, I have this square hole and whatever the shape of the actor, I'm going to beat them into that, you never get as, as, as natural a, a result and, and never you know you're missing all the possibilities that this real person brings so even though of course I had this very strong sense of how Frank would work Michael brought all sorts of aspects much more muscular aspects to Frank than I had thought about it was obviously very comedic at times but then of course you know we are dealing with somebody who's suffering from mental illness which is obviously a very serious thing and so um, doing service to that and um, not making a mockery of that was very important to me. That was the only thing that I would really sort of focus on in that respect. What is that? Such pain. Hey. Such emptiness. Hey! In the case of Donald, I think more than any other part, the idea of John and the feeling of John came alive really only after I cast Donald. That John on the page was a little bit, was much less three-dimensional than the John uh, that Donald brought a life. You know, uh, John is, you know, huge with ambition and tiny with talent. Uh, so some might say we have a lot in common, but, uh, but it felt like everybody wants to be the best at what they do. Everybody wants to be excited to go to work in the morning uh, and to feel like you're valued at uh, what you do. Like, those are really, I mean, that's universal. And unfortunately, his chosen path, he just has absolutely zero talent for and is blind to that fact um, and I guess that was the way in but like I say you know you you're playing a very untalented man you just hope you have the talent to do it you know it's a strange it's a strange combination you should go home Frank picked me to join the band you are fingers being told which keys to push I push my own Ten keys. little bits of bone and skin. And I'm perfectly capable of going to my furthest corners and composing music. There's quite a lot of stuff in parts of Frank where it just came out of the, you know, it just came out. It, you know, it was just like they'd riff on something that was happening in a scene. It would go somewhere much better and we'd use that. And that actually emerged from the relationships that existed. Frank finds inspiration in everything. How does he do this? There was huge dynamism in the room whenever any of us were together because there was always the possibility of music because everybody there is musical and there were instruments lying around. And so there was always this threat that some kind of weird thing was going to begin, which was wonderful. For Frank, you know, you see so much of his personality coming out through his music, which should be the, you know, the necessity of the character. He needs to make music. It's not like he's doing it for, um, you know, Donald's character, John's sort of the same sort of wants that he has in terms of fame and recognition, you know, it's just, it's a necessity for Frank and he needs to do it. It's very much part of his voice and his, um, his expression. So the music was absolutely integral. Here it is, my most likable song ever. Coca-Cola, lipstick ring, go dance all night, dance all night. Kiss me, just kiss me, kiss me, never die, D. This is your most likable song ever? <laughs> yeah. People will love it. I think the film, uh, has an edge to it, uh, which is 
uh, unusual and you don't know what's going to happen. I think the film absolutely has that in its, you know, in its blood, you know, it's, it's just totally in there. Um, we got to the stage where we can tell the story in a mad, mad, crazy way. And yet, to me, the film feels sure-footed despite its insanity. And I think that's a pretty, like, that's a, that's a fantastic combination.